home for Christmas. It's that time of the year. Christmas is here. Everybody done your Christmas shopping yet? Oh, all right. Is anybody done? Close. Close. Your birthday's coming up. That that is uh, Sarah's way of saying, please give her gifts. Um, okay, love is all she needs. How many people you're not sure what you're getting for Christmas yet as far as for people? Anybody still on the unknown side? How many husbands don't know what you're going to get your wife? Okay, some of us, yeah. Some of shame, shame. <laughs> uh, Christmas, I was thinking, you know, it's, it's when you talk about home for Christmas, I think we can all go to different places, Right? We can all go to different memories. We can all go to, to different thoughts, different time periods in our life. Some of us, you don't, you don't want to go back home when you were a kid for Christmas, but you think about Christmas right now with your family, right? You, you've, you've made it made Christmas different. Some of us would like to go back to maybe when we were kids at Christmas time because Christmas now isn't as fun. Um, but I think we can all find a memory today or a, a thought today of what home for Christmas means for you, right? Um, I started thinking about it, and, and um, I, love, I love Christmas. Um, my dad played Santa Claus for, for, for ever, um, and I've got some photos. I always was called the, the head elf, but I was, like, I was like incognito, though. I just wore street clothes. I didn't wear my elf outfit. Um, you can laugh at that. That was a joke. I didn't have an elf outfit. They don't make them in my size. Uh, once you get this size, you go immediately to the Santa Claus costume, uh, just so everybody understands. Um, and and I, I just I have a lot of pictures of, of me and my dad. Uh, my mom was there too, but this is just about me and my dad. Um, but I have a lot of pictures of me and my dad um, where we were, uh, you know, Santa and, and me were, were chumming it up and laughing. Um, when we shouldn't have been. And so, um, but I think about, I think about memories when I was a kid. Um, and I'm going to take you there with, with me today um, for a moment. I remember when, when Thanksgiving would get here, I was already looking forward as a kid to December. Because um, I knew what December meant. I knew that in our household, our rule was, after Thanksgiving, we pulled out all of our Christmas decorations, like immediately, like it was Thanksgiving was over and Christmas was here, right? Out with the turkey, in with the stockings, like that was just how it was. And, and I would anticipate that. I didn't anticipate unpacking all of the Christmas stuff. That was horrible. Um, but it was the decorating, it was the, the putting things up. I remember we would, I specifically took, um, I took a likeness to um, setting up the Christmas village in our house. Does anybody have a Christmas village? Little porcelain homes that light up with a little bulb inside of them? A few of us? No? Okay. Other people are like, that's not anything I know. Um, but I would set up our Christmas village, and I, and I, would, I would take very, like, it was a big deal. I had to be just right. Um, it never looked the same way twice. Um, I remember the anticipation of putting all of the lights on the tree because we didn't believe in a pre-lit tree then. Um, we, we had to put on like 50,000 light bulbs um, on a, on a seven-foot tree, and my mom would sit there, and, and she would wrap each individual branch from the post out. Yeah. Yeah, our electrical bill, we pretty much owned the, the, um, the grid in our neighborhood <laughs> just because of our inside tree. Um, but we would get the lights on, and, you know, that was just watching mom put the lights on. And then as soon as the lights were on, we all got to put on our, or our ornaments, right? Things that we made in school that now in 2023 look extremely tacky. <laughs> yeah, you know, the little, the little crocheted picture frame with the picture of you. Right? Anybody have one of those? Yeah. Yeah. See, you guys are all going with me right now, right? Um, or, or the, or the clear ornaments that you hand painted, that like within like two decades it's clear again, so you can repaint them again. Um, 
I, I remember having a bulb, um, and it was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but it wasn't a glass bulb. It was a fabric bulb, and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were packing presents into the sleigh. I loved putting that bulb up, and I don't even know where it is. It might be in my house. My mom right now is like judging me. She's like, Nicholas Charles. <laughs> We've had this thing since 1987, and you lost it. Um, it's, it's in our house. Um, but I remember putting that bulb up. I also remember um, we, we had this little baby pa papoose, right? That's what it was called? Yeah. Papoose, am I saying that right? And it was this little tiny ornament that came from my, my dad. Was it my, it was dad's, dad, that was from dad. Dad's dad. Dad's dad, my grandfather also. Um, and so like we would put that on last along with a little, one of those little spinner um, ornaments where it was clear, had like a little dome, and then they had like the little thing inside of it that would spin. Do you know that's because of the heat that makes it spin, right? right? Okay. But we would always say when it would spin, that meant my grandpa was with us. That was like a, that was like a, a thing. Um, yeah. So like I always, I remember those things. And then I remember the really good stuff. The day we would make cookies. <laughs> the whole family would come over. Anybody else you gather to make cookies? Yeah, you would gather and you, we would make cookies and we would decorate cookies and then we would eat cookies while we were decorating cookies. So we'd have to make more cookies, right? Um, and I remember no-bake cookies. Oh, those, those just, and I didn't even wait. Did, did, did you ever just not wait until they were cool to use dove in? Like they were semi-cool. They were still like really gooey just because they're so good, right? They're so good. Um, and then the peanut butter cookies with the, with the little kiss on top. I don't know. Everybody's got a different name for those. I just call them goodness, um, <laughs> right? Um, and then we would do the frosted cookies, right? And you'd have every color imaginable, and we would, we would frost them and then lick all of our fingers and frost more cookies and then give those ones away, um, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, yeah. And, and so, like, I would look forward to that. And then after that, we would have a time where everybody would sit down with newspaper um, ads from the local stores, and we would begin. And how many people remember Toys R Us? Yeah. I look at my kids nowadays, and I go, you don't even know. Right. Like, you, you don't even know what a toy story is. Like, they get excited about the toy section at Walmart. And it's like, you don't even, do you know that there was, back in the day, right? Now I sound old. Um, but I'm like, back in the day, there was a store, Nikolai, dedicated to toys. And he was like, what? And I go, the whole store. Yeah. I'm like, it's like Walmart, but all toys. And he was like, no way. And I was like, yes, it's so cool, right? And so like, I remember sitting down with the Toys R Us catalog and circling everything, <laughs> right? Making my list for Santa Claus and like what I wanted for Christmas. Um, and, then, and then I remember you would have that anticipation yeah. the whole month of December, right? And then it would come to schools out, and you know, like, ooh, it's getting closer now, right? And now that I'm a parent, I recognize how, how crazy I probably drove my parents during Christmas vacation now, right? Anybody, you feel that? You're recognizing, like, oh, man, I should have been nicer to my mom and dad. Um, and, 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 then, and then Christmas Eve came. And you go to bed early on Christmas Eve. As a kid, now, as an adult, you know what I'm saying, we, we don't go to bed early. Um, but you'd go to bed early on Christmas Eve. And you'd fall asleep, and you felt like you slept for eight hours. But it had only been 15 minutes. <laughs> and then I would begin to, come on, now somebody else has to relate to this. <laughs> then you'd wake up every 15 minutes. And then you just lay there and listen. Like, do I hear packages being dropped under the tree? Right? Do, do, I, hear, do I hear anything? And you're like, well, maybe. And then like you'd get out of your bed and you'd get to the door of your room and then you'd be like, no. And you'd go back to bed and then you'd go back to bed for 15 minutes. You'd wake back up and you'd do the whole thing again. And then you wouldn't even wait for the sun to rise. Right? You'd be like, listen, I've been laying here long enough. It's probably at least 10 o'clock. <laughs> it's just really dark. Maybe the sun didn't come up today, right? And so then you would, you would, I always, I was usually always typically the first one to the tree. 
And it was like, I think one year, and mom, you could tell me if I'm wrong, or if you just want to go with me, you could just agree with me. I think one year we might have opened up gifts before five o'clock in the morning. Yep. Yeah. Okay. See, I'm not, I'm not imagining that. And then by the time the sun does come up, you're like, I'm done. Like, like, what do we do? And then mom and dad are like, we're going to go take a nap. Right? Like, that's really what it was. But, like, I just remember the, the wonder of Christmas as a child was so much different than the wonder of Christmas as an adult. And to be honest with you, I love Christmas, but the wonder is kind of gone. And I think if we're not careful, we can lose the wonder as a Christian of really what this holiday this month means for us. The longer we're, we're doing this Christian life, I think it's easier to, make the Christmas story what we want it to be. Because let's just be real with ourselves enough and, and put, our, put our, our priestly hood behind us. Let's just be real. Some of us really don't think about how nasty Christmas really was. We don't. The other day I, I, went, I went hunting with, well, I didn't go hunting. I went talking with uh, Tristan and Tracy uh, Simpson, and um, I didn't have a gun. I was shooting deer or any animals with binoculars um, and my phone. And um, I, I, before we went out, Tristan was like, oh, wait, I got to go do something in the barn real quick. So, you know, I'm like, well, I'm here hanging out with you, so I'm just going to follow you guys. And Tracy instantly was like, hey, pastor, sorry about the smell. And I'm like, it's a farm. What, what, what do I expect? Right. I don't expect to walk in and it smell like, you know, roses. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't expect it to smell like, you know, the, the laundry as it's going around and you've got your little, you know, laundry basket or sheet in there to make it smell good. I don't expect that. And, and it smelled like, like, it smelled like poop. <laughs> Fresh, Poop. And then while I was standing there, Tristan lets a cow in. It's standing right in front of me, makes eye contact with me, looks down, and then just begins to poop more. <laughs> and I'm like, cool. This, that's, that's a lot of poop. <laughs> right? But I tell you what, you want to go get a perspective, though, of maybe how Christmas looked. You can go pay $2 and go to Tristan's farm and walk around the barn. <laughs> Trying to help you out, make you some money, right? $2 admission fee to check out what the first Christmas might have looked like and smelled like. You could close your eyes and just be like, Jesus is being born. I can smell it. <laughs> right? We're in the right place. But I think when you take the perspective of a child or listen to a perspective of the child of the Christmas story, you might be able to jar yourself as an adult into really grasping what happened that day. And so the interesting thing with wonder is it is tied directly to humility. So I'm going to read out of Matthew a group of, of Christmas, <laughs> a group of Christmas scriptures. Matthew 18, verses 1 to 4, it says this. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, so who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a small child and had him stand among them. Truly, I tell you, he said, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You guys have heard that Christmas scripture before, haven't you? The interesting thing of this scripture, though, is that we have to have context of what's happening in this moment. The disciples are jockeying for position of who Jesus thinks is better than the other one. 
Jesus, which one of us disciples is the best one? Right? These are grown men who are following <laughs> Jesus and they're jockeying for who's the best. We don't do that, do we? We don't jockey to figure out who's the best. And Jesus picks up a child, calls a child over, which first of all, like the fact that he was like, hey, come here. And the kid was like, okay, that is an accomplishment. <laughs> right? Miracle number one in this story. The child came the first time Jesus said, come here. Come on. Can I get, can I get an amen from some parents out there? Getting your kid to come the first time is like an Olympic sport, right? And he has a child come and he puts the child in the middle of this group of men. Now, I want you to understand at this time in, in Bible history, children had zero rights. Rights for children didn't come until the 1900s. Rights for children is fairly new if you think about how long the world has been exi in existence. And so Jesus picks somebody with no rights, the lowest of lows, because they have nothing except for who they're attached to, and says, if you become like them, that, that, is who the greatest is in the kingdom of heaven. Someone with nothing, a child with no voice, a child with, with, with no money, a child with, with no, no, no ownership of anything is the most valuable and greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And when we become adults, when we become, we, we joke around and we call ourselves, you know, bigger kids, but that's not the reality because let's just be honest. Some of us, you're not a kid anymore. You, you can't even figure out how to have fun. Right? A few years ago, we went to Legoland and I thought I was taking my kids to Legoland because I'm a grown up. I put aside the childish things. <laughs> Only the people who have ever been to my man room, you understand that is not true. I have toys. I don't play with them, but they sit on shelves to be admired. And when I was in my early 20s, I was buying Lego sets, and my girlfriend at the time, Lindsay, was asking me, why are you buying all of these Lego sets? And I was like, because one day, right, this is the lie I told myself, because one day when I have kids, they're going to need these Lego sets, because they're gonna, these things are going to be worth hundreds of dollars, which that is true about Lego, and they're going to be retired sets, and if I get, get them now, they're going to have something that kids their age will never have. That was the lie I said. Secretly, I was building them and then displaying them. I still have them, but now I let my children play with them because the Lego movie convicted me. <laughs> but I took my kids to Legoland, and, and I thought to myself, man, I, I love Legos, and I'm coming to Legoland. My kids are going to be so excited. <laughs> I was a grown-up, and I was a grown-up until they checked my ticket. <laughs> and then I... I saw, well, yeah, I did, I, I saw the, I saw the sign and I, I lost, I lost my maturity. <laughs> um, and I walked through the front gate of Lego and I'm sharing this and don't judge me because I'm being extremely real with you right now. I cried. <laughs> I, I've waited my whole life to go to Legoland. I'm going to cry right now. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> this makes it worse. <laughs> uh, gosh 
darn it, man. Get your emotions in check. Um, I walked through the front gate of Legoland, and I saw my boys get excited, and they took off running, and I just was like, yeah, let's, and I cried. I cried, and I, I had streaming, like hot tears streaming down my face like the Holy Spirit was having an encounter with me in Lego. <laughs> And I looked at Lindsay and I went, I don't know why. What is happening? Because there, there was a wonder that overcame me. And I'd, li I'd lie to you if when we met Emmett, who have you seen the Lego movie, he's the main character? I, I would lie to you if I didn't think about, like, I want to get my picture taken with Emmett. Like, I saw Benny the space guy, and I was like, spaceship, right? Like, that's his line in the movie. And I was like, I was like, I want, and then I was like, go ahead, boys. And I just sat there, and I was like, oh, I hate you guys. <laughs> but it's because there was a wonder. And when I finally got to go somewhere that I've always wanted to go to as a child, all of a sudden, I found that wonder again. I experienced something that I had waited my, my whole life to that point to go do, and I experienced something inside of me that I didn't think was there, and it was like a childlike wonder. I was tall enough to ride every ride. <laughs> I could buy whatever set I wanted to. But I think it's important to understand that when it comes to Jesus, we've got to reattach ourselves to the wonder of the first gift that was given to us. The sense of wonder refers to a profound feeling of awe, curiosity, and amazement that arises when we encounter something extraordinary, beautiful, or mysterious. It's the feeling of being captivated by the world around us, whether it's the natural world, the cosmos, art, science, or even everyday experiences. The, 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 the sense of wonder is when you realize something is way bigger than me. This is way bigger than me. So then we have to break down what is childlike humility? Because if, if humility and wonder are attached to each other and we can't figure out where our wonder is, then we've got to start with our humility, right? This scripture says that, that we're preaching out of today, this says that unless you turn and become like little children. Now, little children, I want to give you the definition because I sat and I thought about this and I was like, okay, little children, who are the children who have awe still, who have wonder still, who, who won't talk back yet? And really, no, 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 it's not 10 and under, Ember. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to update your info today. <laughs> I diligently prayed out, what is the age, Lord? And then he said, look to your children. And I went, not this age, Lord. Um, and, and what I really, what I really settled on is, is wonder occurs from zero to about four or five. Oh, what's going on in the Faust household? <laughs> that was a, should we go... Oh, are we there? Yeah. Two? Well, you got a two-year-old talking back to you? Okay, so zero to six months um, <laughs> is where we're going <laughs> to... But I think, I think we can get to the place, though, because I think, I think if, we, I think if we, we were to have Eleanor take her to, like, a Christmas light show, I think we could all sit there and we could watch the, 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 the gears in her head turn and wonder of what was happening and her not being able to put a word to describe what was happening in here, right? So like we could go like zero to like two, three, four, but once you get to like five, I only know this because we just left five and it hasn't gotten any better than in, in six. 
once you get to five, there's still wonder, but there's also this thing called sassiness, which makes you wonder, where did I go wrong? Right? So we're talking little children, like zero, to, we'll just cap it at four, zero to four. That's our window. Now, this does not mean become immature. Because I think that that's where we go as grown adults. Like, you want me to become a kid? What? No, I am not going to become childlike because that's immature. That's wrong. Ooh, I'm hungry. Did that come out of the microphone? Wow. Ooh, just being childlike. Uh, excuse me from the depths of my soul, apparently. Um, I better drink some water. Cap that thing off and be like, get. Mm. Next week, if anybody wants to bring any. It's home for, home for Christmas. We're preaching this whole series all month long. It's next week, too. You guys can bring cookies every Sunday for me. It's home for Christmas. Um, so, but with this though, is we have to get to this understanding of like, what is childlike humility? Because it's not an immature humbleness, right? So, so number one, there's four things that I, I want to point out. Number one, if you laugh, we're going to get through this really quick. Child, <laughs> childlike humility means you don't exalt yourself over others like the disciples were doing. If you watch zero to four-year-olds interact with each other, typically, now there are rare occasions that this doesn't happen, but typically for the most part, no one is king of the four-year-olds. Typically, they're all in there doing their own thing or sometimes together if, you, if, if, if we're in the right circumstances and no one is above anybody else. Like if you go to the toddler room right now, maybe, I don't know. Sometimes in the toddler room, when I go down there, it, it's very peaceful. There's nobody who's like dominated anything, right? And I think that for us as adults to, to take on this childlike thing that Jesus is instructing his disciples, we've got to change up our humility, which means we should not be exalting ourselves over anybody else. No one is better than the other one. Look at your neighbor right now and say, you ain't better than me. Look at the other one and say, we're about to start a fight. <laughs> I'm kidding. Let's just be real with little kids. Little kids like attention. And if you don't give them the attention they want, they stand there and they go, dad, dad. Dad, 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 mom, dad's not answering me. Dad, dad, right? Anybody? Okay. And that doesn't stop when they become teenagers either. Yeah, look at this. Home for Christmas. We're going to pull all, all the garbage. I know your cookies were so good. You treat me really well. You never look at, hey, you never stand, Addy. I just appreciate you never stand there and go, Dad, dad with me at all. So thank you. <laughs> but 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 we, we have to get to a place though where, where we have to understand kids like attention. Kids also like to be complimented. If you have kids still in your home, think to yourself right now, when was the last time I complimented my child and didn't criticize them? Oh yeah, it hurts me too, just so everybody knows. Right? When's the last time, when's the last time that, that I, I, I gave my kids a pat on the back and I told them I was proud of them instead of me just telling them everything I expect from them? Right? And then compare yourself and go, when was the last time that Father God tapped you on your shoulder and said, I'm disappointed in you? When was the last time Father God criticized everything that was wrong with you? Home for Christmas, <laughs> right? 
Think about it this way. Kids, my, my boys will do this, and I don't know, your, your kids might do it too, but my boys were like, Dad, they, every once in a while they'll come out when they're feeling strong. And they come out and they're like, Dad, chick up. All my bones just cracked. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> Arthritis. <laughs> Holy cow. Holy cow. I'm, I'm falling apart right in front of you. My gut's telling me I need some cookies, and my arm's like, don't flex. You're old. I mean, come on. <laughs> Get with it. Come on. Wow, wow man. <laughs> but my boys will come out and they're flexing. They're like, feel how strong I am, Dad. And you know what they want you to do? They want you to walk over and they want you to take your hand and go, oh. Even if you can't squeeze hard enough because you don't want to deflate it, right? <laughs> you just act like you're squeezing it. And you're like, ooh, man. I'm like, bigger than you. And I'm like, not yet. <laughs> awesome, but I'm going to humble you. Not yet. Not yet. Right? Right? When they're that young, though, they will never argue with you that they are stronger than you when they're that little. Once they get nine, they want to know who's the king of the house, me or you, dad. And if I can't let them know, Jared lets my kids know that he is the king sometimes of our house. <laughs> By not wrestle, we don't wrestle. Because we're adults, and that, that'd be weird. We don't wrestle, but Jared has thrown my kids around a few times <laughs> to put them in their place. Uh, they're not going to argue that, that at that age, they're not going to argue with you that they're smarter than you. I said at that age. They're also not going to argue that they're more capable than you are. Because at, at some point, they recognize that they are little and you are not. At, one, at some point, they recognize the, the big people are much more capable than I am. They recognize that if I want something off that top shelf, I've got to go get a big person to help me. Right? Unless you have a climber, and then they just go do their thing, right? And you find them hanging off the top of your fridge going, I got it, mom, right? The beauty of kids is, is when you can captivate them by telling them a, a story about yourself and they just stand there and you can tell they're taking it all in and in their mind, they're going, my mom and dad are the coolest people ever. Where the story you're telling, they're sitting there and they're taking in every word and they're recognizing like, wow, my dad is amazing. My kids think that. I'm sure they do. Um, but be, and you know, you know they're captivated with it because then they begin to ask more questions. They begin to go, well, well, tell me more about that, dad. Right? Like, like right now I've got a connection with Nikolai. He's starting to like cars, which I'm like, Thank you, God. And he likes to go fast. I'm concerned about that. He's probably not going to get his license at all. Um, but he always wants to know more. Like, Dad, show me the picture of your truck. He likes my truck that I had when I was, was, when I was much younger and more immature. Um, he's like, tell me more about my truck. What did you do with your truck, Dad? How would you do that? Did you do that? Did you build that? Did you, did you add that? Or was it like that when you got it, Dad? Um, when I had my PT Cruiser, they definitely knew that it had a turbo, and they liked it because it was red. And, and all the time, Otto would get in the car, and he'd go, Dad, I, I want to ride in your red car. And I was like, okay, why? And he goes, because I want to go fast. Like, right? I'm, I'm teaching my kids how to be speed demons, apparently. Um, but they sit there, though, and they listen to your stories, and they take it all in. And, and see, as adults, um, we don't like thinking that someone's better than us. I'm definitely not going to like it if I see another man in this, this church flex and his bones not crack. Um, <laughs> that's going to be extremely offensive to me now. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is that adults will tend to draw attention to themselves even if they don't intend to really do that. You know, um, Christians have this hard time of 
of, of not trying to show one another up with their immense knowledge of the Bible or the wordiness of how they pray. Pastors will meet with other pastors and they want to flex on how big their church is because they never want to talk about the problems that they really have. See, adults, we, we've got it mixed up because kids, kids will sit there and, and kids won't one-up each other. Kids will be in wonder of what the other kid has. They'll be like, really? Wow. And then the kid will be like, what do you have? And then they tell him, and that kid's like, really? Wow. Never once are they sitting there going, well, well, Billy has something that I don't have, and I want that. That comes seven, eight, nine years old. Kids don't hear a story and then try to one-up the story. Come on, you all know that one person in your life where you tell a story and your fish is this big, and then miraculously they caught a whale. Yeah. Right? Jesus is telling us that, that he's saying all you need to do is go back to how you used to be before you had any talent, any education, any achievement, or anything else that you can boast about. Jesus is saying, go back to when you had nothing. Go back to when you had to rely on someone else to give you the things that you had. Go back there. That's how I want you to be when it comes to the kingdom of heaven. I don't care, right? I'm just, I'm paraphrasing this, I, I, of course. But he's like, I, I feel like Jesus with the disciples at that point was like, I don't care who's better than the other one. What I care about is, are you going to be here with me? Are you going to be like this child that when I say come, you're going to come to me? Some of us, we've got to ask ourselves that question right now. Has God been calling you and you've been refusing to answer? We get upset with our kids when they don't come the first time. How do you think God feels that he's been calling you for years and you still haven't answered the call he's put on your life? That's, that's where I think we're at today. To get back to the wonder, we have to change our humility by not putting ourselves above anybody else and saying, God, I am humbly nothing before you. I'm nobody before you. When you're okay with being nobody, you officially have started your journey to become great. You don't need a title to be great. You don't need a certain job to be great. You don't need a status in this town to be great. No. In the kingdom matters, the only thing you need to do is being okay with being an absolute nobody. Matthew 23, 12 says, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Number two, childlike humility means you associate with the lowly. Romans 12, 16 says this. It says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. In the uh, King James Version, it says, live in harmony. It's the same verse, just King James Version. It says, live in harmony with one another. How many people need more of that for Christmas? Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. You ever watched a kid on a playground play with kids that they have no idea the status of where they're at? Kids do not pick that, that age because once you hit like 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, you start to pick kids based on popularity. You start to pick kids on who's cool, even if it means you're spending more time in the detention office. Right? Teenagers, if your youth leaders won't say it, your pastor will. You start to choose the wrong friends based on status and not on what kind of person they are. 
Don't worry, we, we as adults do the same thing. But little kids, little kids don't care about how big their mom and dad's house is. I've never once seen Otto run out on a playground and be like, is your house over 3,000 square feet? Do you know what I've watched Otto do? He runs out on the playground and he goes, hey, you got a Spider-Man hat on? I got a Spider-Man hat on. We're friends. And then he runs up to me and goes, dad, guess what? I just made a new friend. He got a Spider-Man hat on. He loves Spider-Man just like I love Spider-Man. That's all that matters to him, right? Last year, Otto shows up at school and in Otto, he was like a COVID baby. When we first moved here, he stayed at home or we came to church. He didn't, he wasn't anywhere else. He wasn't in a preschool and then COVID hit and he still didn't go anywhere. Right? So last year we watched Otto. He didn't want to, he didn't want to go to all day preschool. He cried the first day. He's my kid that, that tends to be a little bit more of a crier and I love it and I don't want to change it. So if you see my kid crying, don't tell him to stop. But he's crying and I was like, Otto, what's going on, buddy? He goes, dad, I'm scared. I don't want to go in there. And then a kid walks by with a Mario backpack. I've never seen tears stop so fast in my life. <laughs> He goes, dad, you see his book bag? I was like, I did see his book bag. He goes, I bet you he loves Mario like me. <laughs> and I was like, you should go find out. He went and stood next to the line. By, the, by, that, by the end of that day, he came out and he goes, dad, you know that man with the Mario book bag? And I was like, yep. And he goes, his name is Xander and we're best friends now. <laughs> they would check with each other Whenever costume day was happening or pajama day was happening, they would check with each other to make sure they were going to wear similar pajamas. <laughs> but you know what didn't go to any consideration of him connecting to that boy was? He didn't care about what color his skin was. He didn't care about how tall he was. He didn't care about how, how skinny or how fat he was. He didn't care about how much money his mom and dad had. He didn't care about what, what car he got out of in the parking lot. He didn't care about nothing other than the fact of we're in the same class. You like Mario. I like Mario. We just became best friends. That's it. But see, as adults, it doesn't work like that with us, does it? We're skeptical of everyone. Somebody comes and needs something, we instantly go to, what's the angle? What am I going to have to owe you? Right? If I do this for you, what am I going to have to, you know, like what? What's going on, right? And you know what's funny is kids don't care until adults tell them and teach them to care. We're the ones that teach our kids to care about who they hang out with based on status, and we don't even recognize it sometimes. If it wasn't for that, they wouldn't know. I remember one of my grandmothers used to complain about me. She said, she told my mom and dad to stop making it so I felt like the world was a bowl full of cherries. I was a kid, I loved life. I was always happy. I never, I never, I was like, everybody's a good person. Come on, y'all remember those days when you thought everybody was a good person? Right, you trusted everybody. You were like, you know, except for the, the man in a white van with candy, you didn't trust that guy, <laughs> not that guy because that was the only stranger that existed was the white van candy type, right? And then it became the guy with the dog that he lost. Then uh, he was a stranger now too, right? But, but we got, then we start teaching our kids, man. Like kids don't care. Kids are like, I didn't care until I got hurt in life. And then I let other people tell me how I needed to care and what I needed to care about, Right? You know, kids associate with people who are in lower positions, just like the king associates with us. What do you think our status is compared to the king? What do you think our status is compared to Jesus? We walk around like we're some big deal. And Jesus is like, really? Hmm. Hmm. You know, I came, to, I came to the earth to die for you. Not such a big deal, right? 
but we can get there. Number three, childlike humility means you're not, you are not wise in your own eyes. Ooh, how many people think you're really intelligent? You're not going to raise your hand now, <laughs> right? Prior to me saying that, though, we probably would have had some hands raised, right? I used to joke around, and I, I, it was always a line I would use with Lindsay. We would be joking around and be like, hey, you know, I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> I wasn't. I've never been a big deal. But I would use that line to try to get her just to at least laugh, right? Little kids understand when they lack knowledge and understanding. Little kids understand it. Like, they're like, I don't know about that. I don't understand that. And then do you know what happens? This is how you know. Because then they ask questions, and these are some questions that have been asked in my house. Dad, where does milk come from? That could be a loaded question. Right? Another thing, where do babies come from? That one, that's a question we... we, we have answered, so I apologize if my kids say anything inappropriate to you. Because <laughs> I feel like the kids need to know. Like, a bird does not, there's a movie called Storks that my, my boys have liked, and they're like, a bird drops our kid off? And I'm like, no, your sister is not going to come with a bird. No, <laughs> and it's not, not how that happens. <sighs> yeah. How about this one, anybody heard this question? Why is the sky blue, Dad? <laughs> See, kids will begin to ask questions when they don't know and they recognize that they don't have the knowledge of those things. And then after you answer that question, they ask the best question ever. Why? Recently, we just had a conversation about babies Nikolai was like, does it hurt mom to have a baby? And I was like, you need to take that one because I don't know that answer, but I, I could probably answer that answer, right? So we said, yes, it does hurt mom when the baby comes. To which then the answer, or the next question was, why? And I was like, let's pull out our biblical knowledge. Here's why. And then Nikolai goes, yeah. <laughs> right? Kids will also point to things and go, what does that do? Or why are you doing it like that? Right? Anybody experience those questions? Like, what's that? What's that do? Well, it could kill you, right? Most of my answers are, well, it could kill you. <laughs> right? Even if it can't, I'm just like, it could kill you. Um, kids know that they have a lot to learn, but the thing about a child is a child is teachable yeah. up to a certain age. Uh, who, who you guys have teenagers, Jamie and Carrie, you guys have teenagers. Anybody else in the house have a teen? <laughs> Laura, you do. I know you're teen. Oh. Um, <laughs> You know, just before service, I asked your mom specifically, I said, hey, is Mia going to be in here? I was like, I, I have something I want to say from the stage. Um, <laughs> that wasn't what I wanted to say. There was one coming. Um, so, so parents with teenagers, because I don't have one yet, and even though I was a youth pastor, they weren't mine, so they acted different with me. Um, at what age do your kids know everything? 11? About 11, 12? 11, 12, we got two years until Nikolai knows everything. I better start studying. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. So anywhere from the age of zero to it sounds like 10, kids are willing to be teachable and know that they don't know everything, Right? And I think the thing is, too, that uh, I think if we took on the humble state of 
I know barely anything about you, Lord. And I have so much more to know about you. If we took that humble position, I think that would come off and look like a childlike wisdom. To understand that we have, we have just touched the tip of the iceberg of what we know about Jesus. What we know about Father God. What we know, hear about this, what we know about the Holy Spirit. I think if we start, just stop walking around like, like, like you've arrived spiritually and biblically and understand. You know, God took me on a journey because this, this is interesting. I'm going to be real with you. God took me on a journey where he was like, Nick, you have, you have, you have misinterpreted some things that I've said. Anybody been there? Yeah. Where, where, where you, you, you read the Bible and you interpreted it and then God was like, wrong. But God, it works for me. And he's like, exactly. It's supposed to challenge you, not work for you, right? And he took me on this journey where he was like, Nick, you, 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 you have, and it's not even like a journey of like, Nick, you've been wrong. He just was like, Nick, because you know, as a parent, you've done this where you just bring your kid alongside and you say, hey, I see what you were thinking, but here's the truth. Right, you give your kid context. And I think we have to be humble enough to understand that I don't know everything about the Trinity that there is to know, and I will never know everything there is to know about the Trinity. And so therefore, I know that I am on a permanent lifestyle of being humbled in my learning. And, and God took me on that journey to the point where I was like, maybe, Lord, you called me to be a pastor and you accidentally met another Nick. <laughs> like maybe I was sitting too close to the Nick that you meant to be called in the altar and I heard it and it was really for that guy because I feel dumb biblically with my knowledge right now. <laughs> Anybody ever been there? But what a place to be to be able to go, Lord, I know nothing. Yeah. You're right. How about that? How about just getting to the place where we can tell the Lord, you're right, and this is a swear word, I'm wrong. Right? Who likes to admit you're wrong? No. Come on, wives, do your husbands like to admit they're wrong? That they don't know where we're going all the time? That we have been lost once or twice? We don't want to pull into the gas station to ask for directions because we know we're wrong, right? Anybody, wives, no? Any guys just want to admit that right now with me? We've been, no, what? Stop, what? What? No, I'm not starting fights. This is for us to grow. <laughs> we're home for the holidays, home for Christmas. All right. How do you think I'm going to stay in business? I got to have counseling too. You know? <laughs> They ask me monthly, how many counseling hours have you put in? And I got to tell them that. Um, First Kings 3, 7 says, now, O Lord, this is, this is Solomon. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father, David. But I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Now, you can read this, this scripture without context and go, well, yeah, he was a child when he was called. Do you know he was 20 years old when he said that? He's not a child. I mean, when you're almost 40, 20 year old, you're like, yeah, you're a, you're a child. Um, he's 20 years old. He's a man. And he's saying, Lord, I am a little child and I don't know how to even go out or come in. And do you know what happened with that? The Lord was pleased. All he wanted was wisdom. Like, Lord, give me wisdom because I, I'm a child. I don't know how to come in. I don't know how to go out. I don't know. And the Lord was so pleased that the Lord said, I'm going to give you that and more. I'm going to give you what you want. I'm going to give you wisdom, my child, right? So part of childlike greatness is realizing there is a lot about God in the world and how to conduct myself and how to relate to people that I haven't learned yet. Point at yourself right now. 
and say, self, Oh, not everybody's doing it. Say self, my eyes are closed. I just feel there wasn't enough voices. Self, self. that sounds better. I, I don't, don't know, know everything, everything. About, about everything. everything. And, and, this isn't in my notes, I'm just adding this. I, I get, it wrong get it wrong a lot. Okay, does that feel better? Does it feel like something just was released off of you just now? We get it wrong. We don't know how to handle every, every situation. We don't know how to handle every person. I'm waiting for some amens for y'all just to realize all that, right, to get there. You're still learning. Okay, look at your neighbor right now. And say, have grace for me, because I'm still learning. Look at your other neighbor and say, I'm going to have grace for you, because you're still learning. Okay? Matthew eleven twenty five 25 says, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, because this was your good pleasure. When he's referring to infants, he's talking about his disciples. These are the men walking and talking with Jesus, watching him do all these miracles. And he's referring to them to God, his father, as infants, thank you that they're sitting here like babies listening to every word I say, Father. Some of us just got to come to the Lord and sit at his feet like we're, we're, we're just a child listening to the Bernstein Bears books at nighttime. Bernstein? Bernstein, those are the guys that are lawyers, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you might have to sit at their feet and listen to them too. Uh, Berenstein Bears, you're sitting there listening to the Berenstein Bears stories just going, wow, right? Some of the younger people don't know, probably know what those are. That's fine. The majority of the audience knows exactly what I was talking about. And the contrast he gives to them is he's comparing infants, his disciples, to the wise and intelligent and then referring to like the fact that they think that they have it all. And guess what? God, thank you for giving it to the infants and not giving it to them. He will reveal great truths to those who know they don't know much, but he'll hide truth from the ones who know it all. Right? Number four, we're on the last one, folks. Thank you for flying. On the Nick Airlines today, please keep your hands and feet in the vehicle as we approach the tarmac. Um, number four, childlike humility means that you're submissive. This is a hard one for me to, to put in because nobody wants to submit to anything these days, right? World and in church, it don't matter. Nobody wants to submit to anybody. You know how I know that? I won't tell you how I know that. The Holy Spirit just was like, don't do it. <laughs> nope. But I know things. Um, nobody wants to submit. The, the submit is like a, a dirty word that nobody wants to say in 2023. Everybody wants to just live your own way. Don't submit to any authority. Do your own thing. We even got, we even got the Bible being rewritten as we're speaking. So I just want to encourage you, if you have a paper Bible, hold on to that one because that's got the original translations in it. The digital ones are being redone right now. When Jesus called that child over, that child came directly to him the first time and submitted himself to the will of Jesus. He had no idea what Jesus was going to do. 
but a big person said I should come over here and I'm going to submit myself to them and say, okay. Jesus has asked me to come over here and so I'm going to submit myself to him and say, okay. Generally speaking, kids know that they're not the boss. Kids know that they're not in charge. They know, they know that they must comply with the will of a big person at some point. And I think we, we live in this world and it's bled into the church that to let others, to let others, for, for us to submit ourselves to others, it's, it's a form of weakness. Or, or it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a meaning of the, you're afraid to fight for what you believe in. Or even this, if you let somebody be over you, then they're going to take advantage of you. Now, yeah, there's some truth where people have done that, but it's the fact though, that we've allowed that to, to, to discredit even when Jesus calls for us. We won't even fully submit to him. We'll give him enough that we're comfortable with, but I'm not going to give you everything. Ephesians 5.21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's Bible. That's not, that's not my words. Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Put the preferences and interests of others in front of, of, of you. That's hard. This year, um, this year has been an interesting year. I, I've, we've gotten a lot of phone calls for help this year um, for a lot of things, a lot of different, it, 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 the, it's, a, it's a very vast thing. And, I, and at, at the beginning of the year, I used to call the board and I would get everything approved. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lie. I'm just going to like call myself out right now. Um, so hopefully they can forgive me. At the beginning of the year, I would call them or text them and I, and I would run everything through them before I would just help someone. And then like halfway through the year, I was just like, why won't I help someone? Um, and I get it. Like People play the system, Right? But I've played God's system, and so have you. And yet God never withholds his help from us. And so I got to a place where I was like, you know what? I, I, don't, I don't care who it is. Now, I mean, if it's the same name, naturally, I'm going to go, hmm. But people who've reached out to me, I mean, I've, I've given... I've given away money with no expectation of a return. I, I'm just here. I don't expect anything, just here. Let me, let me help you. Uh, let, let our church bless you um, with anything. And you can tell when somebody really needs it. They're not going to just play the system. I feel like I need to tell this because I feel, I feel, like, I feel like we get to this place where, where we always feel like somebody is going to take advantage um, of us, especially around the holidays. But I've never had God withhold anything from me that I needed. Now he's withheld things from me that I didn't need that I wanted. But God said, use me as an example of 
putting others over your, your needs. And I think what a humble thing that we can do is if in, in the world of 2023, we can sit here and go, you and what you need is more important than anything I need. And do you know what the beauty of that is? If you're doing it for someone else, the person to the other side of you is going to do it for you. But we don't think about that, do we? We don't take that scripture and go, I need to apply that to my life, anything. I'm not asking you, and I don't think the Lord's asking you to be a doormat. He doesn't want you to be a doormat diva and just let everybody walk all over you. But understand, though, that when you give out of what you don't have, when you pour out into somebody else that you don't have, and this isn't just a money thing, this is anything. This is just your time to pray for someone. How about your time just to put your hands on somebody and pray for someone? With the good words or confused sounding words, because you know what? God knows your heart on what you wanted to say, right? But what if we started just putting others before ourselves. Because if I put Ashley's needs above my needs, and I said, well, Ashley, Ashley needs me more than, more than I need anything. She needs me to, to, to help her with her needs. And then Ashley was like, well, I have needs, but I need to put Jared's needs over my needs and then Jared's like, well, well, I have needs, but, but I need to put Arlie's needs over my needs. If you began to just go down through this room, eventually we're going to get to Paul. And Paul's going to go, well, nobody's on the other side of me. Well, you know what? Pastor started this thing, so I'm going to put his needs over my needs. And we've just completed a whole circle and circuit of people who are sitting there having their needs met by someone else, but also meeting somebody else's needs on the other side of them. And that's a humility that brings wonder back into the equation. When the church of Acts grew the most, it grew when everybody else brought what they didn't need and gave it to the people who needed it where they just said, I don't need this anymore. Boy, is that a sermon in itself? How many people have stuff at your house that you haven't seen in years, but it's still there? Do you need it at this point? But there might be somebody who does, right? So what if we started doing that? Everybody's needs in this room would be met if we just started taking care of the person to our left or the person to our right, because we know the person on our other side is going to take care of us. Whew. Talk about a different level of humility and freedom that we would all operate in. Right? But you've got to get humble enough to submit yourself to each other, knowing that you're not going to stab each other in the back like they did Jamie last week when he said Ohio State was, he said some derogatory things about Ohio State. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, yeah, I know, I'm sure you don't. I watched the video last night and I was like, what a mean guy. Um, but if we got to the place where we just said, you know what, I'm going to submit myself to my brother or to my sister and I'm going to put their needs over mine, having faith that a brother and sister behind you is going to do the same thing for you. Could we not change the culture of church, big C? Could we not change the culture of more than likely this town when all of a sudden everybody's like, that doesn't make sense. It's the way it should be, but we've lost the wonder of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. No, everybody's judging you. You might as well just pick it up. Um, <laughs> you just ruined my really serious point at that point. Feel bad. Um, But there, no, I didn't. I know exactly where I'm going. <laughs> this is what happens, though, when we lose the wonder of Christmas. Christ-miss. 
This is what happens when we lose that wonder as an adult of what it really means. I read this book, and I know I got to let you go, but I, the Lord would be mad at me. I was reading this book to my kids, and I thought, it's a kid's book. There's no way I'm going to wreck myself. But I was reading this book, and it's about a Christmas pageant at a church. And all the kids who took main parts were the lowly of the kids in the town. And everybody thought, this is going to be the worst Christmas pageant this church has ever had because those kids are animals. Those kids don't know Jesus. Those kids don't know the importance of who Mary and Joseph is. They don't know that, that Mary was a virgin and she was just so. She birthed this baby and was so full of joy. She was perfect. Look at all the statues of Mary. There's not an ounce of dirt on her anywhere. Her skin is pure white. She, she's, just, she's just beautiful. Everything was perfect, but I don't think that's how it was, and neither did these characters in this story. They brought a reality, and they said, what do you mean the, 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 our Savior, the King, was being born, and he was bo being born in a barn? Didn't the innkeeper know, like, this is royalty? Why wouldn't you kick people out of the inn to bring royalty in? This is somebody who doesn't know Jesus saying this to them. What do you mean Mary had to give birth to Jesus in a barn where animals were pooping and peeing? What do you mean? That's disgusting. What do you mean that the wise men brought gifts to Jesus and they were perfume? What baby wants perfume? Which I was like, that's a good point. The girl playing Mary held, held baby Jesus by a limb as she walked down the aisle. She patted him on his back like, like he had the hiccups. How do we know Jesus didn't have the hiccups? But her brothers, and this is where I broke, <laughs> because it was one of those families that, you know, they get a Christmas basket donated by the local community so they could have a good Christmas and the brothers were the wise men and they were confused as to why a baby would need perfume. And so when they came down the aisle, they didn't bring perfume. They left all the bottles that they normally used. And behind them, they pulled the Christmas ham that was in their basket so they could have a Christmas dinner because they thought, surely if Mary and Joseph had gone through this journey being hungry and thirsty and living in a barn waiting for their baby to be born who was royalty, who was coming to save us, surely they would be hungry. And they drug what was supposed to be theirs to the altar and sat a ham in front of baby Jesus. And then they were supposed to exit the stage. Instead, because they were animals, they stood off to the side and sat down and just stared at baby Jesus. And I read that book and I cried through the last three chapters and my boys looked at me like, dad has lost his mind. <laughs> but it's because out of a child's wonder over a baby who was king, they recognized that it didn't make sense and they were wondering why. Why did they struggle? Why were they hungry? Why were they thirsty? Why were they in the middle of poop and pee? Why, why, why? And I think we need to move aside the story that we envision in our heads today 
And we need to take on that image of the, the, what the children thought of, and we need to go, you know what? My first Christmas gift I ever had access to was dirty. Wasn't perfect. At least the scenario, he was perfect, but the scenario wasn't perfect. As mom and dad, I think about pregnancy and, and you're exhausted. And you just rode in a camel. It's not like you got there on a Cadillac. They were sore. Yeah, donkey, not camel. Why did I think camel? Wise men, camels. You get it. And all the kids that thought this was going to be the worst pageant of the year, when they were done with this pageant, everybody was like, I can't even put my finger on it, but this was the best Christmas pageant we've ever had. And it's because it made Christmas so real and the wonder of a child so present of what the birth of Jesus probably really honestly looked like. And so why do I talk about becoming like children today when we're supposed to be talking about all the beauties of Christmas? Because I want to challenge our humility so that we can have a different level of wonder this Christmas. And not a wonder of gifts and trees and lights and all the things, a wonder of what Jesus and the birth really meant for each and every one of us and how crazy, crazy, crazy of a circumstance our king was born into. We've got to change our humility as a church, as individuals. We have to. We have to take on a childlike humility this Christmas. Look at baby Jesus through a different lens this Christmas. This book, I don't even know if I'm allowed to do this. I don't care. I'm not getting any money out of this, and dang it, I wish I, man, I should have thought about that better. But this, this is called the, the best Christmas pageant ever. And um, read it, buy it, read it, think about it. But what a perspective it gives baby Jesus to me this Christmas. I'm not going to lie, the other day I looked at all the gifts that I have wrapped already and I, I looked at it and I went, man, Jesus, I got to make you the best thing this Christmas more than I ever have. And give my kids a perspective that isn't just, you know, Mary and Joseph went to an inn and the guy said, I don't have room. Here's a beautiful barn, Right? We live in a world of barn dominiums. People choose to live in barns nowadays. It wasn't a barn dominium. It was dirty. But we got to take on a childlike faith and childlike wonder this season as we come home for Christmas. Let's go back to how we once were before we had anything to be proud of. <laughs> the sense of wonder encourages us to approach the world with an open mind, a willingness to learn and a recognition of our place in a much larger scheme. And it's a powerful force that can inspire personal growth and a deeper appreciation for what Jesus truly did for us. So this Christmas, I want to encourage you. If you want a good Christmas sermon, go watch a zero to four-year-old and the wonder in their life. Watch how they are. If you've got littles at home, read the story to them and let them ask all their questions. Regain the wonder that I had when I walked into Legoland as a grown man. Regain that same wonder 
for your Savior this Christmas. We've got to come home to wonder. That's what we've got to come home to. The prayer team will be in the altar after, afterwards, but um, today is just a day of really honestly, um, I just felt, I felt it last night as I was just going over my notes and I just felt like today is a day of, of really like checking your humble meter. Checking your humility when it comes to, to Jesus. Checking your, your humility when it comes to how you live your life day, day to day. Um, to recapture that wonder back of Jesus. So the prayer team will be down here if you want to meet with them to pray. If you just want to sit and, and have your own time with the Lord, uh, we'll give you that time. If not, just, we ask that you go to the, the gathering place to be respectful of that time. But um, let's just pray together and just be challenged today. Lord, I just... Um, God, I ask right now that you just make us children. Man, that's a weird prayer, Lord, but God, I, I really just make us children in, in the way we, we have awe and wonder of you this season. Make us children in, in our, our humility. Make us children in, in how, we, how, how we associate with people. Make us children, Father, in, in each and every one of these, these ways that we've talked about today. God, I, I ask that you challenge us this Christmas season, that, that it's just not another Christmas. You know, it's not, it's not just a, God, this year has gone by fast. And God, if we're not careful, December and Christmas and celebrating you will go by so fast that, that we won't even take the time to have awe and wonder over you. The awe and wonder of sending your only son and then the awe and wonder of that son loving us so much to give his life up 33 years later. Rekindle a new wonder and awe this Christmas. God, help us when we're picking gifts out. To just say, what is this really about? Why am I doing this? Lord, my, my kids can hate all the gifts. But I don't want them to miss the love of you this Christmas, the wonder of you this Christmas, the awe of you Christmas. God, I, I, don't, I don't want to miss the wonder and awe of you this Christmas. So help us. Help us keep Christmas this year in perspective of, of, a, of a humility, God. Being humble like a child, Jesus, you, you said it. You, you said you got to be like one of these to enter the kingdom. And, and, and let us, as followers of you, become like children. Answering your call, submitting ourselves to, to your word, and, and running after you, Jesus, and just being, being there with you. Jesus, give us... Uh, uh, Give us the, the awe and wonder of a child with you. Let us look at you with a different perspective this Christmas. Let us throw our traditions out the wind and just rekindle a tradition with you. God, I just thank you. Thank you for your word and and God, I thank you that, that it doesn't fall on deaf ears today. So speak to our hearts, Lord, and challenge us to change. Challenge us to become humble. And if we feel humble, let us become more humble, Father God. Let us get to a place where we understand <laughs> we're lowly and you came for us. And we just humbly, humbly put ourselves down at your feet and worship you this, this season 
more than we ever have. Thank you, Lord. Amen.